In the past three years, the global economy has been hit by a series of major shocks. Now, we've experienced waves of the COVID-19 pandemic, geopolitical tensions, monetary tightening, and even a recent banking crisis. Now, it's been nothing less than a roller coaster ride for the world economy. But amidst all of this chaos, both the Nifty and Sensex indices reached all-time highs this week. In this episode of Informed Investor, we'll delve into the factors behind this rally. The global spotlight has been firmly fixed on interest rates. Now, we'll take you on a journey into the world of central banks and their battle against inflation. Now, you'll discover where these powerful institutions stand on the trajectory of interest rates and how their decisions shape the economic landscape. Now, as an investor, understanding the pulse of the economy is crucial. In this episode, we'll go beyond the stock market frenzy and explore several economic indicators. Now, these indicators will provide us with some insights into the current state of the Indian economy. Let's begin. You're watching Informed Investor, an initiative by Research and Ranking. off with the stock market. The Indian markets have been performing exceptionally well recently. This week, both the Nifty 50 and Sensex indices reached their highest closing levels ever. The Nifty exceeded the crucial level of 19,000 for the first time in history on Wednesday, while the Sensex crossed 64,000. Now, over the past three months, the Nifty has experienced a rally of more than 12%, while the Sensex has increased by over 11%. Now, the broader markets also participated in this rally, with the Nifty mid-cap 100 rising by 13%, and the Nifty small-cap 100 increasing by 20% over the last three months. We see the markets doing very well. So, what are the factors contributing to this rally? Now, one significant factor is the FII equity flows. After being net sellers in the past two financial years, FIIs have shown increased interest in Indian equity since March 2023. In April, they bought about $1.4 billion worth of Indian equities, followed by $5.3 billion in May. In June, FIIs invested around $3.9 billion, making it the highest among selected emerging markets for the month. Now, another crucial factor is the decision of the Reserve Bank of India to post the interest rate cycle. After raising the repo rates six times since May 2022, the RBI decided to hold the rate steady at 6.5% in its recent two meetings. Now, the decision was in the back of easing inflation and the need to stimulate more economic growth. Now, the pause in interest rate hikes has provided much relief to investors and had a positive impact on the Indian markets as a whole. Now, the fall in crude oil prices has also played a significant role in the market rally, considering that India heavily relies on oil imports. To put things into perspective, India actually imports about 85% of its oil. After reaching highs of $139 per barrel, global oil prices have remained below $80 per barrel for over the last two months. However, we are cautious due to the recent production cuts by OPEC Plus and Saudi Arabia as they hold significant influence over global oil prices. Nevertheless, the recent decline in oil prices after highs of about $139 per dollar has brought relief to the Indian markets. Now, we also witnessed a slew of strong macroeconomic indicators released recently. Now, this has also contributed to the rally. Now, we will discuss this in detail at the end of session, but for now, let me give you a gist of it. GDP growth rate of 7.2% for the fiscal year 24 came better than expected, which supported the rally. Inflation in the country has moderated to a low 4.25%, close to the RBS target of 4%. Additionally, positive developments such as improving GST collections, strong manufacturing and services PMI, increasing number of domestic air passengers and automobile sales, and a more favorable current account deficit have all boosted market sentiment. Now, it's important to note that global market sentiment also influences the Indian equity markets. This highlights the interconnectedness of the global and domestic market conditions. Recently, positive trends in global markets have also contributed to the gains in the domestic market. Now, improving economic indicators in the US and indications of a likely stimulus measures by China has also propelled sentiment globally. Now, let's shift our focus to interest rates. The debate about global interest rates is changing, and this has investors wondering what will happen next. Will central banks post the interest rate cycle? 
Let's talk about inflation first. In the 12 years following the 2008 global financial crisis, there was excess supply as such China's continued to industrialize, inflation was muted, interest rates were at historical lows, and there was excess money in the system. After the pandemic, a new challenge emerged, which was inflation. Now, this has been a big problem for the world's economies. The main reasons behind this inflation spike can be traced back to the loose or expansionary policies governments and central banks used to combat the economic slowdown caused by the pandemic. Now, they made it easier for people to borrow and spend money, hoping to boost economic activity. However, this led to high inflation. Now, another factor which aggravated this inflation situation was the supply crisis caused by Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now, to address this inflation issue, central banks have been increasing something called interest rates. So why do central banks raise interest rates? Well, if inflation gets out of control, it can lead to serious problems. So central banks try to keep inflation at a target level by increasing interest rates. For example, the US Fed targets 2%, while India's ideal inflation target is about 4%. Now, when interest rates rise, it becomes costier for people and businesses to borrow money, which tends to reduce spending and slow down inflation. Now, let's also consider the situation when the economy is shrinking, meaning there's a negative growth in the GDP and we face negative inflation. Now, this can also be problematic. In such cases, central banks lower interest rates to encourage spending and investments. When interest rates are low, companies can borrow money at favorable rates, which they can use to invest in projects. Now, this investment creates more job opportunities, stimulates economic growth, and eventually leads to inflation again. So we see it's a continuous cycle. Now, with inflation cooling in some parts of the world, some major central banks are starting to think about at least pausing interest rate hikes. For example, US has paused hikes but said clearly that inflation is still above their target level and a pause in rate hikes should not be seen as the end of the monetary tightening phase. Now, the Reserve Bank of New Zealand raised its cash rate to a 14-year high of 5.5% in May, but also said that the rates would not move above this level, which is a strong signal that its tightening cycle was ending. But many central banks, including the European Central Bank, the Bank of England, the Reserve Bank of Australia, and the Bank of Canada raised interest rates in June as their fight against inflation continued. The Bank of England raised interest rates by 50 basis points to 5%, their highest since 2008 and the largest increase since February after it said that British inflation would take longer to fall. We see many countries are at different points in the interest rate trajectory. But in 2022, we witnessed a period where major central banks around the world were raising interest rates at an aggressive pace. However, as we move into this year, the rate hike cycle seems to be slowing down and some economies are taking a pause from further interest rate increases. Compared to major global peers, India is one of the first to have ended its rate hike cycle and has moved into a period of stable rates. Now, India has done well to maintain GDP growth while also reducing inflation. Now, considering that the inflation is within the RBI tolerance band of 2 to 6%, rates are unlikely to rise from the current levels. However, global macro and geopolitical risk still exist. Amidst this crisis, let me explain the current state of India's economy. In the fourth quarter of fiscal year 23, India's GDP expanded at a better than expected rate of 6.1%. Now, this growth was an improvement from 4.5% seen in the previous quarter. The positive performance was primarily driven by garment spending and notably net exports, which did not drag down growth as it usually is seen given that India is a net importer. However, despite these gains, that there are some causes for concern. Now, gross private consumption expenditure, which shows how much a consumer like you and I are spending, fell as a percentage of GDP to 58.4% in the fiscal year 23. Now, this indicates that India's consumption has been somewhat uneven in the country. Now, inflation and interest rate hikes have affected purchasing power, given the six consecutive rate hikes and inflation being above 6%. Now, urban consumption has also remained strong, but our rural spending has been slower to recover. Now, the weaker private consumption is a worrying factor, even though it may be difficult to fully comprehend when considering the strong growth in consumption sectors such as trade, hotels, transport and communication services. Now, looking ahead, lower inflation will support the demand in urban areas, but the situation in rural areas will depend heavily on the distribution and impact of the monsoon rains. 
Now, for fiscal year 24, the growth rate is expected to moderate to 6.1% compared to 7.2% in fiscal year 23. Now, this is due to a combination of factors, including the normalization of the base effect and a slowdown in external demand. Now, according to IMF predictions, India is still expected to be the fastest growing major economy, while the global growth rate is projected to decline from 3.4% in 2022 to 2.8% in 2023. Now, following India, China is expected to grow at a rate of 5.2% in 2023, which will further decrease to 4.5% in 2024. Now, several rating agencies have also revised their estimates for India's economic growth upward. For instance, Fitch Ratings raised its estimate for India's economic growth for fiscal year 24 by 30 basis points to 6.3%. Now, this adjustment was based on a stronger economic performance in the March quarter of fiscal year 23 and positive momentum expected in the near term. Now, Fitch also acknowledged the potential risk associated with the slowdown in global trade, which could have a downward impact on India's growth. Now, SNP Global Ratings also stated that India is likely to grow at a rate of 6.7% for the next three years, retaining its position as the fastest growing major economy. Now, while these developments are positive for the Indian economy, it is important to note that the global economy is still experiencing a slowdown, which can potentially impact India's growth in the short term. In April, there was a notable decrease in retail inflation in India dropping from 5.66% in March to 4.7%. Now, continuing the positive trend, retail inflation in May further eased to a level not seen since April 2021, reaching a mere 4.25%. Now, this marks the third consecutive month of decline and falls comfortably within the target rate sent by RBI, providing some much-needed relief. Now, there are certain factors that could contribute to a decrease in inflation. Now, these include falling commodity prices, the delayed impact of monetary tightening, and a favorable base effect. However, uncertainties remain regarding the monsoon outlook and the potential impact of El Nino. Now, the Reserve Bank of India has forecasted that inflation will reach 5.1% for the fiscal year 24. Now, although inflation is expected to remain below the RBI's tolerance band of 4-6%, to it still exceeds the central bank's ideal target of 4%. Overall, the recent decline in inflation is a positive development, but it is important to monitor various factors that could influence inflation levels in the future. The industrial output performed better than anticipated in April, primarily due to an uptick in manufacturing output and strong growth in the construction sector. The IIP rose to 4.2% in April from 1.1% in March. However, the consumer durable goods segments, including the manufacturing of auto components, two-wheelers and garments, continued to underperform, hindering overall growth. Looking ahead, achieving a sustainable increase in domestic consumption, including rural consumption, is crucial for driving industrial output growth. Now, the easing in, of in domestic inflationary pressures is a positive factor which could support demand in the economy. However, challenges stemming from an uncertain global economic scenario and weak external demand are likely to persist. Now, let's talk about another indicator of the Indian economy's strength, GST collections. Now, gross goods and services tax collections in May witnessed a 12% rise compared to the previous year, reaching Rs 1.57 trillion. Now, this is the fifth time since the implementation of the indirect tax regime that GST collections have crossed the Rs 1.5 trillion mark. Now, this increase in collections can be attributed to a recent upswing in industrial and business activity, along with high inflation playing a supporting role. Now, India's good exports, however, have been struggling, experiencing a contraction of approximately 10.3% in May, while imports declined by 6.6%. Now, the performance of India's goods exports will continue to dampen in the short term as global demand remains subdued. On the other hand, our service exports have shown resilience with a year-over-year -year growth of about 7.5%, defying the global slowdown. But there was a slight setback when comparing on a month-over-month -month performance. The overall trade deficit that is exports minus imports narrowed to $10.35 billion in May compared to $12.2 billion in the same period last year. Now, this reduction in the trade deficit has contributed to a decline in current account deficit too, which now stands at 0.2% of GDP, down from 2% in the previous quarter of fiscal year 23. Now, it is expected that the current account deficit may further moderate as the values of India's exports and imports are anticipated to soften. 
Now, in terms of other economic indicators too, the situation in India remains stable. Bank credit growth and asset quality has remained steady. Additionally, there has been positive developments in air passenger traffic, the use of credit cards, electricity generation, real passenger traffic and also UPI transactions. Now, we can observe from various indicators that the Indian economy is relatively stable. Now, this stability is also reflected in the performance of the Indian stock market. However, there are areas of concern that we need to address. One of the concerns is the underperformance of our merchandise exports and this may persist due to challenges in the overall macroeconomic environment. Now, moreover, consumption patterns have also been inconsistent with rural growth still in the process of recovery. In the short term, we anticipate some obstacles that could hinder the growth of the economy. Nevertheless, when it comes to long-term equity investors, our main focus should be on the overall trajectory of the Indian economy over a long period. As we have mentioned several times before, we believe that the short-term challenges will have a minimal impact on the long-term growth story of India. Now, if you're a long-term investor, keep this in mind. While I say this, this is me, Merlin Sudana, signing off. Take care and stay invested. Did you like watching this video? Then download our app, Informed Investor, to watch more such informative and interesting videos.